Um, I'm Olivia Las Gonzalez, the gallery director here, and I want to welcome you to this program, which features the Osage artist Eugene Standing Bear. Uh, in conversation with John Lonley, who's the retired curator of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas at the St. Louis Art Museum. I'm um, really excited to have them both here um, to talk. Um, I think it's going to be a real treat. Uh, the talk, of course, is held in conjunction with the exhibit that surrounds you, which is the Imagining of St. Louis exhibit. Um, and this uh, we put together, it was co-curated with David Anderson, and we put this together in celebration of the city's 250th birthday. I do want to recognize uh, that we would not have been able to do this exhibit or the catalog that comes with it without the generous support of Mary Pillsbury Fine Jewelry Company. Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Amarin, the Bellefontaine Cemetery and Arboretum, Eleanor J. Moore at the Ed and H. Pillsbury Foundation, the Bannister family, and Barbara and Arthur McDonald. This gallery talk and the commission of a painting by Sean Standing Bear, which you'll see in the third room um, if you um, walk through the exhibit, was made possible by the Ed and H. Pillsbury Foundation. And with special thanks to Nancy Pillsbury Shirley and the Art. Thank you so much for um, this. Um, we wouldn't have been able to bring him out without that support. And, Wonderful. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about Sean. Uh, he was immersed in art from an early age. His grandfather was a commercial artist and draftsman, and his father was a painter and photographer. He had early instruction in contemporary art from his father, who was a student of the realist painter and member of the famous Dallas Nine, Alexander Cove. Inspired by his father on a roll of white butcher paper, as I'm told, uh, that he brought home, Sean began to draw the painting. Alexander Hope also served as an important mentor to Sean, encouraging him to embrace a career in the arts. As a child, he attended summer art workshops at Philbrook Art Museum in Tulsa, where he excelled in life drawing and woodcut printing. During the fourth grade, he took up art of wood carving. His passion then turned toward the study of color in all aspects and mediums. He also experimented with sculpture, creating his first in sandstone and concrete debris when he was 12. He also experimented with lost wax, bronze work, and dry point etchings. An extensive art library in his home contributed greatly to his development as a young artist, as did the art programs at the Catholic and public schools in Tulsa, and the, art, the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where his mentor was the important Native American artist, T.C. Cannon. Cannon introduced him to Japanese calligraphy and helped him to understand the power and significance of light and shadow. Today, he works in all media, including painting, jewelry, murals, sculpture, ribbon work, finger weaving, and doll making. He's also, um, that not withstanding, he's also a historian for the, um, and has a vast knowledge of uh, the iconography of the Osage art that you see around you. Um, and he assisted uh, with the selection and procurement of the Osage works in the Art of the Osage exhibit, which was at the Art Museum uh, in 2004. <laughs> He also co-wrote the essay, Osage Aesthetics, A Curatorial View, with co-curator John Nunley for the exhibit catalog. And uh, has lectured on traditional and contemporary Osage art and culture at Oberlin University and the Sophia University in Tokyo, Japan, and at the École d'Art at the University in Toulouse, France. He is made a lifetime member of uh, L'Occitania um, Society in Montauban, France. And uh, so he's a working, practicing artist. And uh, my bio on John, uh, although his is just as long, I'm going to keep it very short. Um, he has an, an amazing career. Um, he was the curator of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas for 26 years at the St. Louis Art Museum. And that time he built that collection there, created installations from the permanent collection, and curated and co-curated innumerable exhibits. 
Among them were, of course, the Art of the Osage exhibit in 2004, as well as a wonderful exhibit, Masks, in 99, Caribbean Festival Arts, Each and Every Bit of Difference from 1998, and then also a note was his 1987 book, Moving with the Face of the Devil, Art and Politics in Urban West Africa, in which he chronicled his time spent with urban West African gangs. So, um, without any further ado, I want to introduce them both and uh, let them have the floor. Thank you. Hey, thanks for coming today. Thank you, Olivia, and uh, thank you for this amazing exhibition of the Fountain of St. Louis. Um, Sean and I have met through Nancy Pillsbury, and uh, she, I, you and I first met at uh, Jack Parker's for some fundraiser, and, 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 and I said, what's that lady across the table? And I was new in town, and uh, to my surprise, she did this Native American work. And um, she said, well, we ought to do a show on the OC. I think just what I want to do, I want to play school, you know. And I started thinking about it, and she would call occasionally, and then I went down to the Museum under the uh, arch, and I didn't see anything else safe there. We talk about founding and crediting, and of course, history is written by those people who control the present. As Voltaire said, history is a pack of lies that we can play on the head. This is quite a big lie, because as you all know, the Osage controlled 42% uh, of the Louisiana fur trade. One of the reasons people came up from New Orleans to establish that fur trade. So I thought, well, maybe we could redress that with massive support. And in 1999, I went down to the tribal council. I met Sean and several other people who are not with us anymore. Um, Leonard Maker and um, Preston. Preston, Preston Morrell. And uh, I was sitting around the table with Nancy. It was a different place for me down at the Phillips Hotel. And I knew I was being watched. You know. It's part of the thing, being an outsider, which I'm always an outsider, and somehow that evening made it through. We got started on the Odyssey. And through that time, a very important friend of mine, uh, Elise and Paul Kahn, who are here today, uh, would always say, Paul, we go to lunch. And Paul eats really fast, so you have to say things quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Paul said, how's it going? And then Paul uh, celebrated our, I guess we'd say our triumph for the Osage, the return of the Osage to St. Louis. And Paul and Elisa opened their doors uh, and had a tremendous hospitality for us. And I'd like to thank them for that and also to dedicate my part of the talk to those two people who are true friends of the museum. And the well, um, Indeed, our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, how did we start with this? Well, just to finish that little story. In the uh, restaurant at the Phillips Hotel, John was sitting right over there. No, right here. And uh, Preston was next to him. And Preston is a man of, um, was a man, well, and some still is, a man who earned and deserved more respect than most people you meet. He was a road man. Uh, priest in the Native American church, Philly church, Westman, by the way. Anyway, that means something to some people. Um, anyway, John was going on, they were talking, and Nancy was looking beautiful and charming. <laughs> and then he looked at me and he said, no, Sage, so what does this guy really want? And just deadpan, you know, and John's sitting there smiling, looking right at him. And then I just said, he wants this. He wants to give us an opportunity to put our best foot forward. And they're going to do it with Daniel Swan, Dr. Swan, who are going to be a chapter about the Native American Church and its influence on the Osage. And this is he, we came to you as a source. We want you to tell us what to say, what not to say, what you know. And uh, it's kind of up to you. You know what, and we want to know what you think is appropriate. And he thought about it for a while, and the next thing you know, he just he opened everything up. And uh, by the way, she's never had it before. <laughs> I was scared. 
Well, I'm not sure. Because when he asked you that question. Yeah, and he, he, he talked to me and, and he was like talking about you. And he, I knew you could tell what yeah. he said was talking about you. I thought my career was over. So, <laughs> anyway, it was charming. It was wonderful. It was a great experience. And uh, John helped me uh, more than anyone will ever know. And again, I, I really appreciate the cons for recognizing John and his hard work. I, that was so wonderful. Uh, I think it was, um, well, I don't know. It was very appropriate. Um, Enough of this. this is well, okay, fun. just just one other thing. I want to talk about what this show does. It's, it talks about the founding. It's very complicated. It's who founded it? When was it founded? How far back does it go? Of course, the OCS go way far back in early Europeans. But I think a show like this would begin to see the diversity that is this region, the country, because it's where all the great rivers come through. It's the, the interstate highways of pre-concrete highways. Um, we all come in in different boats, but we're all in the same boat now. And if we could, shows like this, and discussions that we'll be having, and questions and so forth, that's uh, the, the driving passion in, in my life. And just, I want to show them with Sean a little bit more. My mother is 96, I'm doing her memoirs, and, uh, oh. yeah, she, I, I don't remember this. And Sean's got a, a, a coat. But it's very different. You want to show it? Yeah, we can do a little show and tell her. Um, was that yours? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. And I used to play in this coat with my dad's. Yeah. Unborn bison, little airplane on the back, they're all cut beads. And that dirty stuff on the collar, that, that's chocolate stains. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, these are wine stains, Sean. <laughs> well, the thing is, is Dorothy explained this because we're going through. She said, I remember as a little girl, a settler living in Montana in the 20s, would go to Rodeo. He wanted to bring it. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really kind of like a little right back there. I'm not the I began to look at this in astonishment because these are guys riding horses. Horse culture was Osage culture. Not only that, but so certain things are worn, and these, by the way, are shields, Native American shields. So already back then, people were getting together and sharing. They were all in different boats coming together in one boat now. And this is the, the back of it. And I thought immediately, wow. So you know, this is done in the heavy material that Sean's made out of onboard bison. So anyway, so the two of us share that at home. Now, what the show? Sean, Show this? Yeah. This is a little boy. We've been meaning to fix this ribbon work for a long time. I'm just going to be short here. But this is a little vest that belonged to my great great grandfather. And to, you know, I'm sure curators are horrified that we handle these things. But it's just having some fun. I'm retired. <laughs> but uh, you know, we we like to let the kids play and stuff like this. And, all my kids played in that little bison jacket. And this is unusual because this was made back when Osage was still in Missouri. And this, you see, there are some historic photographs that have this particular design and these locking bolts on the shoulders. And that, not just to cover the seams, but to imbue the person with that power. And I was told that this is the morning star and the evening star. And they are which way ever one if it's daytime. Yeah. Anyway. But well I just, as you can see, it's not the reason why it's so strongest is it was made right. The beads were made to look more like a fabric. I can feel like a fabric. But you can you can pass it around if you want. But, um, <laughs> but at home, uh, it's not unusual to see kids out there playing in their 
great grandpa's clothes or grandma's clothes. So I've seen little girls running around and ribbon work and dragging it you know, around. But it, it still is tough. Uh, back to the, the founding here. Olivia was very smart with this expedition and she included a lot of Mississippi pottery in the expedition right behind us. So you know, how, how far back does the founding go? I mean, it's, that's a question that uh, there's no one founder of anything. It just it takes collaboration of many peoples and many cultures. But uh, there is a connection with the pottery, uh, with the Osage. Uh, we think when Cahokia, for example, collapsed, one of the uh, issues was food. And when you have a society without at least a burden except for people, to bring in food for a growing center, it gets harder and harder and harder. So collapse, basically. But there was also a new strand of corn that came in that allowed people to leave the bottomlands and move out to the prairie because that corn needed less water. And we think Sean's people were one of those elite groups at Cahokia. We said, man, we're out of here. Yeah. Uh, talk about pottery and then... Well, different academics, scholars, historians, and we've talked, and there are some wax cylinders in the uh, I think American Folkways Department, Smithsonian. Yeah. And uh, Francis LaFleche, the uh, ethnographer, was Ponca, French, and uh, he was something else. Omaha? Omaha, oh, no, excuse me. Yeah, yeah it's because folks were big yeah. in the Omaha tribe, anyway. And uh, I'll. Uh, but he came to Osage County around the turn of the century, and uh, he was, back then, the remnants of our ancient religions still existed. They had stopped going through the motions back in the 1890s. But, you know, what do you do when you're fully fledged, initiated, fully initiated uh, Osage in this religion, and suddenly Peodeism comes in, Catholicism comes in, grants peace policy, and the rule of one denomination per reservation. All that stuff affected him, but I've got photographs of these old priests sitting around the show on the, on the front porches, getting fat and nothing to do. So they were kind of, uh, I used to hear stories when my great grandmother would say, you know, they, they kind of became impoverished because part of the, uh, the method of the religion, social religious order, uh, was dependent upon the need for interdependency, everybody working together for survival. And LaFleche did a lot of inquiries. My great grandmother, Julia Lookout, was instrumental in opening a lot of doors for him in IA. Uh, and also uh, uh, John Joseph Matthews. You know, I talked with him and he told me how helpful she was. But she was one of these people, you see the book, The Art of the Osage, with the tattoos. And just for the record, they didn't use ink back then. They actually used the ashes from an elm tree. And they would use the bundles of needles, and they would lift the skin up, and then rub the ashes out of the skin. My sister's wife. <coughs> Um, but I, I'm going to pass this around to you because she was, uh, the way it was explained to me by my father, and she pretty much raised him because my grandmother was one of these wild Osage girls back in the 20s and 30s that liked to drive fast and have fun. Like all the other girls, but she was the chief's daughter and she thought she had a special privilege, I guess. That's what my grandmother looked like with her shirt on. Her whole body was tattooed. Front and back. And if you know how to read those symbols, uh, there's a history of the tribe coming to Earth from, uh, wow. is it Sirius, the dog star? The dog star. Where our essence was in that area and we were compelled to come to Earth. But some of those designs, like this, like a spider web or whatever on the elbow, those are, those are traps. 
and these lines on their arms right there, those are trails, hunting trails that the highway system is run on now. Those are the oh ancient trails. And also, uh, there's a sacred knife mm -hmm. on them too. It's everything, it, but they're, they're hidden, they're split and inverted. That in your mind you put it together. Huh? What was it in the it's a, it's a, it? It's on her chest too. You see the back end of a tang? Mm -hmm. That's an arrow, uh, it's an arrowhead. But it's cut in half, and then the point, it's reversed. You're supposed to put it together in your mind. Wow. And in the back, uh, her back was, uh... anyway, I, my point is, and LaFleche understood that, and he got a pretty good picture of how the tribal organization was. And the ceremonies, I mean, like thousands of lines. And these ceremonies had to be memorized. They had mnemonic devices, these tally sticks to keep order. But talking to all these academics and scholars of all kinds of sorts, uh, Garrick Bailey, Dr. Bailey, uh, he uh, said this is the last remnant of this Catawan societies, Mississippian right. societies, and uh, that is the connection to this pottery. In fact, in Fayetteville, Arkansas, there's an amphora that the black bear people had four black stones, and they would light this fire at midnight, and they would put this stone in amphora, and you can tell it's got seven cedar trees etched into the top, mm -hmm. but it's, a, it's a, I don't know, maybe it's a sandstone or something, anyway, and they would make the ceremonial food for the enemies with that. And the food, they would, it was all very ritualized. And, uh, but the order in which things were done and the organization, many people think that was the last viable living evidence of a Mississippian culture. You know, Sean, I'm thinking about um, Olivia Brown from the Tribal Art Museum, Tribal Museum, with the pivoted woodpecker ivory. Mm -hmm. And it's What's the animal, ermine, or what's the animal on there? No, it's the sessions of stuff. Oh, yeah, this is those a are, show. Those are pieces of swan's throat. Swan's throat. That this Trump is a magnificent Trump. piece, and then we did it's hero. ivory bill right. uh, uh, on the front that's split and turned inside out and painted. But those are pileated with the yes. scalps going around. Well, what's interesting about that, and further founding and connection, is when we did hero hop and open hand, there was a work in stone, a Mississippian piece, where the guy was wearing the same headpiece mm -hmm. is, is in the exhibition. So that is another really firm connection. Well, well also some of the sure. copper pieces, too, I've yeah. seen that yeah. are similar. But um, these ways, like always, evolve or they perish. And the ones that perish, whether there's a memory of their existence or not, depends on how memorable they were to the conquering people. Yeah. And then again, half of the facts from that source could only be true. <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting looking at the painting over here, the founding of St. Louis, which was done, what, about 100 years later or something, in the last part of the 19th century. And it shows, you know, the depiction from a European point of view, and you have these little things that are flying in the sky, I guess you call them angels, and uh, guys pouring rum from, in from that barrel. A lot of people have muzzle loaders in there. They're Native Americans in full regalia, and uh, war, bonnets. war bonnets, and uh, teepees. And so this artist working at almost the turn of the century is trying to recapture all these people coming together. This was a very metropolitan area for a long, long time. And, uh, but you know, it's, it's loaded with propaganda because the conquerors have the flags and have God on their side with those angels as his brother. And this the light, the blessing of the light, the of the, of the light. light. So this is a very different approach to religion in the founding of not only St. Louis, but the founding of mankind embedded in Genesis in the Bible. Where the, what always intrigued me about the Osage, uh, and I'll just do this in general, Sean always said, well, we're really a scientific people. Uh, and I'm trying to 
we're on the phone for a couple hours every time we talk, and he said, well, you know, job. And he said, no, I don't, job. I don't know. And he said, well, there are a few things that you should know. And he said, in terms of the Osage cosmology, there is the knowable, right, the unknowable, the seen, the seen, the unseen. and the unseen. I'm thinking contemporary physics, you know, the Higgs field, things we can't see, we divine from things we can see. So you get this dialectic religion, and if it doesn't work, you don't do it. So I think that's one of the keys to your survival and prospering, is having well, the flexibility. And the Osage, I was always told, and explain, I asked what the word, I heard it referred to the Osage as pragmatic. And we're people that are very conservative and refuse to move in any direction unless you prove to them that they need to. And they usually wait to the very last second. They'll watch everybody else flounder and then they'll make their move at the last minute. Some say it's a very disastrous, scary, risky way of living, but the Osage watched the, uh, what was that, the Dawes Act and the tribes yeah. dispersion of the uh, reservations. And the Osage said, well, first of all, and the Osage were holding up statehood in 1906 because the government was not going to create a state with a sovereign nation inside of it. So they had to settle us on the idea of a lot of it. And a great man named James Bighart, uh, he, who spoke five languages, by the way, and was also a cavalry officer and um, in Civil War. 220 years, they just signed up up there in Kansas, and they dispersed them on the east, saying, well, you know, these scouts would be great. It's only great if you know the land. What do these Indians out here know about the east coast? Anyway, out of all that, I think about 20 came back. Wow. Yeah, land, you know, that's such a big issue. Um, there was a great film that my and I watched called, what is it called? That Thanksgiving, what's it called? What's cooking? What's cooking? Yeah. And there's a, there's a line in the film where they're talking about Thanksgiving. And one of the persons who's a young, rebellious girl is at the table going, oh, this, this is all bull crap. Right? She says, I think we should not call it Thanksgiving. We should call it Thanksgiving. Well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> referring you know to why, the why all the Indians were crying at the second Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> because they thought the first dinner was a going away party. This exhibition that Olivia has done, and, and it's a side that's sort of the I love maps, and there are great maps here. And Westerners have their own way of tracking territory and using a written language to describe who owns what, and the map is the deed. Osage have a very different way of tracking country. And, talk about the Osage tree in the, in the park. Want to talk about that, how do we track land? Not by maps, and maps are beautiful here, but by other kinds of territorial markers. Well, plants, but animals too. Each clan had a certain domain over animals. Like he wanted to hunt black bear people. I'm from the black bear uh, people, was something. Anyway, it looks kind of like a black bear. You kind of use it. True, not a deer plant. But you can tell those folks they're kind of sinewy and all this. They dance around, and and figure skating around. We're not hurting nature. And anyway, uh, it's good. I, I like, you can see all the deer women in one place. Anyway, um, <laughs> we're very graceful. Uh, but the the domain, black bear people are forbidden. I. I was told as a young age, if I eat, ever eat bear meat, it'll kill me. And if I ever touch uh, bear fur, uh, it's going to cause uh, paralysis, arthritis, or my limbs not to work anymore. All this taboo about your own life symbols. Now, this only applies to the black bear. I can't speak to the other clans because I'm not of them. I, I, in fact, it's taboo, really, to, to discuss other clan affairs. But uh, we were the ones who sanctioned the hunt for the hibernating bears. And in exchange, we demanded only two things. 
I mean, I've heard, you know, black bear fur makes a great saddle, best saddle, you know, or, you know, it, 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 there's all kinds of uses for black bear material, but the Osages demanded the claws mm -hmm. and the fat next to the spine of a hibernating black bear. And that was, that's that washihala, that bacon rind, its name was corrupted from, and it meant the fat that was very precious and very hard to get next to the bear spine. And they used it, and each client had different uses. Some mm -hmm. made medicine. A lot of them made uh, hair treatment out of it. But in exchange, the Osage, uh, the black bear people would have the authority to uh, barter or grow different plants that were within our realm. Like our client has a certain kind of gourd that we're only authorized to grow, and it's in that book. It's that my sister's book. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as marking the territories too, they would do things with stone, and they would they would make signs in the ground, you know, and, and be like landmarks. But they wouldn't have them above the surface; they'd be flush, you know, because they were like secret. They didn't want anybody like messing with their, their symbols. What about the tree? Mm -hmm. You'll say with a little curve. You tell me what you remember of that and I'll tell you. Well, what I remember, we, we, had a, we have a tree in the Kennedy Forest. Hit by lightning. Got hit by lightning, unfortunately, but you look at a particular tree, it'll have a grass. Is this an Osage tree? What is the name of the tree? Bodark? Bodark, yeah. And you're talking about the markers? The, the, yeah, the limb that goes up, it's tied down, and it's allowed to grow with a big curve. And when you see it, you're in a Osage territory. And, it, and then also they would pull them down and they would wave it down and they would cut the end off so some of the end would still be there. But as they would grow, um, they would point at water sources mm -hmm. and uh, different landmarks. So. And you can always tell them Osage well, they're uh, rectangular and they're angled. That reason why they're angled is so you can walk down. Sean, what you're saying to me, this, this is kind of new for me uh, about land and founding. It's not so much that people own the land, it's the rights to use the land. Yes, exactly. There you can't own Which the land. is a very different point of view. The name Monjon Akita, yeah. uh, Charlie Whip's name, meant guardian of the land or Monjon. Uh, the land soldier, uh, soldier of the land. Protector of the land. And the Monchon or Kido, his responsibility, the chiefs he had a Sishu Kaika and a Hunta Kaika. And one was a peace chief, one was the earth chief, one was from the sky, earth, and the Wasaji people were actually water people, part of the earth. But they had two chiefs. The French figured this out a long time ago, the British never did. Uh, the Americans figured it out and used that against us with the medals, the big medal for the peace chief, the smaller medal for the war chief. Anyway, what was I talking about? <laughs> uh, You're, to, uh, I don't You're supposed to uh, tell me when uh, I go off on a tangent, remember? <laughs> I have a question. Mm -hmm. On our property in Wildwood, um, and we've got about 78 acres, my husband told me this story, and I don't know if it's true, but we had a lot of trees that are bent over. Mm -hmm. Now, huge trees that have been yeah. over and, and branches growing straight up by mm -hmm. 30, 40 feet. And was that. You go like this and then knock like that. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. what we have on our property um, in the deep woods. Are you say, I, I'm, I missed the explanation though. Are you saying that these things, in order to mark it in, into one territory, were guided in this growth? It wasn't a natural phenomenon. Yeah, yeah, they would turn they up were, and they would wave the, the, wave the yeah. limb down. Right. And it would just grow that way. And they would come, you'd have to maintenance too to make sure it was in the right direction. And then sometimes, uh, on Country Club Road, there's, there's like big stone monoliths. You know, there's this one, it's about as tall as a ceiling, but about a third of it, I think, is underground. Mm -hmm. And it's about mm, eight feet by maybe five feet. 
and uh, those were like just meeting up places, you know, and creeks where they converged, those were meeting places for hunters and such. Yeah, the, the, one of the reasons I, I, I feel that... Oh, I know what I'm saying, no, Old Shore Akita, yeah. the, the, guard, uh, the, uh, the guardian of the land had the authority to tell both chiefs, we depleted this area, we've used this creek with the latrine too much, so, you know, it's just the, the ground cannot, the earth cannot support our folks, and we've got to move, and we're going to move tomorrow. And uh, they make an announcement, they're going to be ready to pack it up and move. Sometime then they send scouts out in advance, and, and, they, and then the great crane people, the night people, the night walking people, they always live a little bit away from camp. And when everybody would leave, even on the buying the bison hunts, they'd stay behind and clean up and like take some of the frames and make sure everything was stashed and hidden. So when they came back, they, they would take uh, the wood frames and uh, make these little, uh, I don't know what you call them, a jig out of tree branches. And, and they would slide them in. And you just walk up and grab one of the beetles and you're ready to go. But they had to hide those from other tribes because they were. Well, when they knew when we left, we'd leave in force and they would come in and see what was there. And they would, you know, all power to them, but you'd get caught. I, I think one of the things that explains why the Osage, uh, as a group of people that have not been part of the lexicon of exhibition and popular subjects, because the Osage didn't fight. We never went to war. We never went to the war. They were basically and foremost business people who use warfare as a strategy to maintain those resources, to create the business, to make the money. Well, the clan priests were... Not very were, romantic, but you know... So they were warrior priests. Warrior priests, right. Yeah, and uh, this whole scene, the real scene is going on in that painting, what really happened, but unfortunately you can't see, it's right behind the old clan priest's head, but the young guy's looking at it, you see. Because the ships are yeah. pulled up, Yeah. And, but they're all, you can see the terrain is leading to a spot. So anyway, that's a little bit left to the viewer to figure out. It's like, where's the flags? Where's the black rose? Sure, well, that's, it's there. It's just going to be your interpretation. We ought to go back and take the folks back. Shall we? Well, look at Sean's painting about the founding. Has anybody seen it already? Uh, yes. Oh, let's go. Oh! Let's go. Okay. 